for inviting me to come and speak this morning. Um, I am a deacon in the United Methodist Church, and I do work for the Missional Wisdom Foundation. And the elevator speech for that is that we experiment with and teach about alternative forms of Christian community. So that means a whole lot of different things. It means new monastic living, it means co-working spaces and shared use commercial kitchens, it means economic empowerment for refugees, it means disability theology, it means art meditation, it means spiritual direction and missional living, uh, it means asset-based community development. Those are all a lot of sort of buzzwords in the industry in which I circulate. If they didn't make any sense to you, that's okay. It just my point is that we do a whole lot of different things, and we experiment in a whole lot of areas so that we can figure out what works, what doesn't work, where do we need to give more attention, where can we let go a little bit. And so um, we also teach about all of those things, and it's pretty fun and exciting. I love it. I think it's fantastic. Sunday morning is terrific, um, but I'm a little bit unconventional, and so I like to do things a little differently, and missional wisdom works out really well for me in that way. Um, and I think we do a lot of great things uh, with community building and, and all of that sort of thing, too. So. It works out, not just for me, but for, uh, for everyone. So today I'm here to talk to you about prayer. Uh, it's kind of a foundational, central part of being a Christian and a Christian life. A lot of different ways to pray, a lot of different ways people understand what prayer is, what it does, what it doesn't do, what it's not. Um, we have about 40 minutes to talk about like thousands of years of a very um, broad topic. So... I'm gonna hit on a whole lot of things, kind of scattershot, and um, see what uh, resonates with you, and then if you wanna learn more about that particular thing, then you can always uh, ask questions, or look that up, or, or things like that. So today is sort of skimming across the surface of a whole lot of different things. Uh, and in thinking about how I wanted to organize what we're talking about today, I think there's some important distinctions to make. And one of those is that of the different kinds of prayer that there are, I mean, this maybe sounds a little obvious, but I just want to start right at the top. Uh, you can pray by yourself in private, something that's internal. You can also pray corporately with other people, like we do in worship services, or if you get together with a prayer group or some other such thing like that. Um, and then uh, I put down here at the bottom, contemplative and active. Uh, contemplative is a prayer form that involves what's called the via negativa, so I know big uh, Latin words again, but I'm oh, sorry, I'm a wordsmith. I love words, so they're coming, lots of them. Um, there are two kinds of prayer. One is called apophatic and one is called cataphatic. And they basically, one of them means, cataphatic means praying about who God is and what God is. And apophatic is praying about what God is not. So we can say God is love. God is like this thing that we understand. God is like a river. God is like a king. God is like, you know, sort of images that you can, can grasp. And then you can also say, well, but God is not um, spiteful. Or God is not uh, a rock. Or God is not, because God is a king, but God is not a king. So there, there's this balance on either side. So if you think of inter in terms of praying, like cognitively thinking wise, and then praying to like forget all of that cognitive thinking stuff and be able to just be in the presence of God. Contemplative prayer is a lot about being in the presence of God. And um, critics of contemplative prayer would say it's like navel gazing. You're just looking internally at yourself all the time. Um, and, and that's only half true. It does involve a lot of sitting quietly. It does involve a lot of introspection. But it also involves a lot of opening up to hear what God might have to say and to learning from God uh, and about God through sitting in silence. And for some people, sitting in silence is really, really difficult and uncomfortable. And that's why I included number four up here, which is active, which are the kinds of prayer that involve either moving, walking, other people, touching things, sensory information, all that kind of stuff that's not just sort of sitting and being open, but that involve movement and doing and more active things. And so when you're looking for a prayer practice that works for you, and not every prayer practice works for every person, that's the beauty of the diversity of prayer, is that you wanna find something that fits with your personality and with your learning style or with your, uh, with your preferences. So I've got four um, sort of spiritual styles up here. Uh, and you might be able to recognize these in yourself or people you know. Uh, if we break them into base four really basic categories, one is people who like to learn they like to think about things. Uh, you feel like you've had a great spiritual experience if you've gained some new understanding or new knowledge. 
Um, and so you can apply every prayer practice we talk about today. You can sort of, in each of these categories, there's a prayer practice that appeals to a different style in a different way and with a tweak to it to, to make it appropriate to what that person might prefer. So some people really like to learn stuff and we'll talk about what kinds of things would be specific to them. The second one I have is building community. Some people are really social. They don't want to play or pray by themselves. They want to pray with other people. They want to build relationships and they want prayer to bring them closer to God and also closer to other people. So we'll talk about some of those. Oops. Um, number three is active missions or social justice. These are also very, um, not necessarily just movement oriented, but like doing something. I want to be doing something. Uh, I want to do something that feels like it's making a difference. I want my prayer to be purposeful and intentional and um, that sort of thing. So we have that category. And then the last one is the mystics. And mystics fall really solidly into that contemplative camp. I just want to sit, I want to be quiet, and I want to hear the voice of God. That's where I fall, so my presentation admittedly is a little heavy in that contemplative direction. Um, <laughs> it is what it is. So styles of engagement. Um, this is very similar to the other one, but it's a little bit different. Um, in terms of how to structure what we're gonna talk about today with prayer, I had to think about how am I gonna order, like, I won't say thousands, I won't even say hundreds. What's the word for tens of things? Tens of things? <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a hundred, maybe not a hundred, but tens of things um, of, of ways to, to take a particular kind of prayer and, and um, alter it so that it appeals to somebody who likes to think somebody who likes to, to, to have you know, manipulatives or be moving their body, people who like to, to use their senses, who like to hear and smell and taste and involve all of those bodily senses in prayer, and then people who either want that quiet private time or that togetherness time. So um, we're going to, uh, if you think of it like a, it's not really a flow chart, but kind of a connection of things that are connected to each other. They overlap a little bit, so you're gonna see some things I have listed in one category that are also in another category. This is because they work for more than one people group. So you're like, okay, Wendy, enough with the theory. Let's get to some specific examples. Um, so if you are a learner and you um, want to be able to pray in a way that will help you to learn something every time you pray, you'll probably be more drawn to things like written prayers, liturgy, uh, in, a, in a church service or something uh, where you actually have to figure out what is going to um, be said in the prayer that will make it um, functional and special and um, powerful as well. So the things I have here are that are listed sort of briefly what each of these are. The collect, we'll talk about that in just a minute. I have an example of that. That's a written prayer. It's a very specific prayer form. Um, creeds, confessions, and liturgies, you use those every time you do communion, I imagine, um, and in worship services. Lexio Divina is a prayer form in which you would sit with scripture or a poem or some other piece of written material, and you would read it, and you would, you know, a very short section, a paragraph, maybe, and if a word or a phrase rises to the surface, then you would sit with that word or phrase, and you would ask God, why is this the phrase that's coming up for me? Why, what, what is either a resistance that I feel, this phrase makes me feel uncomfortable, or something that fills me with peace or joy or some other positive feeling. So it can either be positive or negative, whatever strong feeling you have, and then you explore that. You ask God, where is this coming from? Why do I feel this way? What other things in my life do I feel this way about also? And then how might that be changed by inviting God into that situation or, or looking for where God might be working in that situation. So there's a, a piece of sitting with scripture and then also quiet reflection. And then I didn't put it in any of the categories, but this applies to everybody. If you're into journaling and writing your thoughts down, that applies to everybody, either before, after, or during any, any of the prayers. Lexio Divina can also be done with pictures. You can do Visio Divina. It can also be done with music. You can do Musica Divina. They are all basically the same process, but the thing that you're asking God to speak through is either words or sound or visual. You see how we're hitting all the different senses there. Gospel imagination is an Ignatian prayer practice. It's really fun, I think, and that's where you sit down with a gospel story from the Bible, and you imagine that you are in this story. And so you don't have to get all you know hung up on like what's accurate or what might have really happened or 
anything like that, but try to just sit yourself into the story, maybe as a member of the crowd, maybe you're one of the disciples, maybe you're even Jesus. It, it's another kind of, you know, asking God to place you and to help you find a place in this story, and then asking those questions about what would I say? What would I respond if someone else said something? What would, what would that person say? Or what might Jesus say to me? Or what might I say to Jesus? And you sort of let the story play out after you've read it twice, then you put it aside and you let it play out in your imagination and imagine out how it might have happened. And sometimes God can give you a really interesting insight into that story or into something that you didn't think about before. And again, not necessarily raising that to the level of scripture, but just saying that that's valuable for you to understand where your spirit is and what things you might be struggling with or what you might uh, need to ask for, for help or guidance or something like that in prayer. I put pilgrimage in here because I didn't really know where else to put it. Pilgrimage isn't necessarily prayer, um, but it's definitely filled with prayer. Pilgrimage is simply the act of going to a holy site. So it could be the place where somebody lived and worked, some saint or famous spiritual leader or person. It could be a place where something very significant happened. So in the process of pilgrimage, there are several stages to that. There's the preparation for the journey, there's the journey itself, there's the pilgrims that are traveling with you and the hardships that you encounter along the way, and then there's the reaching of that place, the destination, and then coming back and re-entering regular life again as a transformed and changed person because of those experiences that you had in seeking God in that place. And so um, I put pilgrimage in this category because it seems like you learn a lot of things about people and about yourself and about uh, not just traveling in the destination, but also about how you handle hardship and how you relate with other people when you are traveling with them, uh, and what sort of spiritual things you learn about that, that place or that person who lived in that place that you are seeking as the destination of your pilgrimage. So um, the collect. The collect, there are two forms. One is very simple. It's basically addressing God, asking for something, and then wrapping it up. But the, the more um, lengthy version, and I think these are really fun to write. So if you ever, you can think of them as poetry if you like, or you can think of them as just writing some kind of um, prayer. You could use it if you're ever asked to pray in front of a group. This is a wonderful form to help you not be terrified about what you might say. So you can think about it in advance. There are five sections. The first one is an ascriptive address. So you're calling God by name, and you're using some kind of description of God that is whatever the theme of this prayer is going to be, that God is this kind of God. The second part, and this is a lot of kind of big words, but the principal cause of saving action of the God which forms the basis of the petition. In other words, you just said that God is this thing. How do you know that? What else has God done that has demonstrated that God is that thing? And so you would include that as your next line. The third line would be the petition. What is it you're asking God to do? Then the desired result of granting the position, petition. So you can say, you know, this kind of God who did this kind of work, please do this thing so that this other thing will happen. And then a doxological conclusion is basically bringing it back to Jesus, naming Jesus as Lord or, or Christ. And so here's an example, it's a little bit ridiculous, but let's say that we wanted to write a prayer talking about the richness and the sweetness of God. So we could put it into the form of chocolate, right? Sweet God, giver of chocolate. So sweet God is our ascriptive. Giver of chocolate is the affirmation that God has done that. God has given us that wonderful gift of cacao. Help us to taste and see that you are good. That's the petition, that's what we're asking. Why? so that we may trust and share the richness of your love for us. That is the desired result. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, that's the doxological conclusion. Doxology means glory, so it's giving glory to God. And then simply amen at the end. So I think that's really helpful. If you ever have to say a prayer, it's easy to put one of these together. If You can, you can Google that on the internet and find those five things. Um, but... I think it, it helps you not to like ramble, and if you're trying to pray for a specific reason, then you know you can kind of get to the point. And, and as a devotional practice on your own, if you're not planning on praying it in front of other people, it can help you ask, you know, what do I think about God, and where have I seen God do that before, and what am I asking for, and why, and you know, praising God at, at the end of that. Uh, so I think that that helps distill all of those things into prayer. I think um, sometimes people think that prayer needs to be spontaneous in order to be really heartfelt. 
Um, and I would disagree with that. I think that there's a time for extemporaneous prayer where you're sort of talking um, at God, and then there are times when it, it, it's important to think about things and to, to be, well, contemplative and thoughtful and introspective and take time to write those out. I don't think it diminishes the power of the prayer to write it out in advance. Um, that, that's a personal opinion of mine, but um, I, I wanted to say that. Uh, because I know for me, when I was a young Christian, uh, I didn't become a Christian until I was in high school, and, and so I learned um, as, a, as an older, not child, um, not as an adult either necessarily, but not as a child. And I, I think my understanding of prayer was I have to go sit in a chair and I have to fold my hands and talk and hope that God is listening because I really don't know. And, and I didn't get a lot of information about how to pray and what to say and all that sort of thing. And so to me, I find this very helpful uh, in terms of, no pun intended, but collecting your thoughts and putting them all down in a particular word. So that's can a cult. You, can you tell us why you call that the col collect? Collect. Collect. Can you tell us about that word? Wow, that's a really good question, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> that's what that looks like to me. Right. Um, but it's called a collect. A collect. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to think. I thought maybe you had a Latin something in your pocket. Already. There probably is a Latin something, um, but I don't have it with this one. Good question. <laughs> See, I can admit when I don't know. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, community builders, social prayers. So if that first category was people who like to sort of be deliberate and thoughtful and cognitive, this is a category of prayers for people who like to get together with other people. So that would include things like forming a prayer group where you get together, I don't know, every week or every whatever, either uh, in a group or with just a prayer partner. Maybe you talk on the phone with someone else and then you pray together um, either out loud or just in the same room together. Um, the circle of trust that I have listed here is a contemplative prayer style where basically everyone gathers together and you check in, how is it with your soul? And then there's no advice or fixing or judgment or anything like that. You've just shared how your soul is doing. And then you sit in silence for 20 minutes together. And then you, you can use, you know, those, there's an app for like the Tibetan prayer bowls that you can have it as a timer and then it'll ding at the end of the 20 minutes. And then well, you're done and, and you walk away. You, you could stay and talk about how that went for you or you could just let it be. It depends that part on the, the socialness of, of what you're looking to do. Um, I've been in groups where people have, uh, and this particularly happens, I don't know if your pastoral staff works this way, but when we have lists of people that need prayer, uh, the pastoral staff will sit down and will simply lift up the names of people. We won't like go into a big long what they need, but lifting their names before God. Some people um, find that to be very, um, <laughs> again, no pun intended, but uplifting. Uh, to be able to lift people up, which is our fourth category here, which is intercessory prayers which basically means praying for other people. And there are a whole lot of ways that you can do that. And um, one of them, or several of them, are listed here, intercessory prayer. And I brought some um, visual things here. So uh, I have the rosary listed second, but I think I'm gonna talk about that one first. This is not actually a rosary, it's too small. It's just a set of prayer beads, but um, yes, the rosary is a Catholic prayer practice. Um, St. Dominic in, I think, 12, 14, uh, Mary came to him and told him to do this form of prayer. It's very repetitive and very specific. Um, so quickly, just to give you an idea, because I think it's important to know how other people pray. I think that's valuable. Um, each of the beads, and I think I have a picture of this. Uh, yeah, here we go. So the rosary is always in this configuration. There's a cross at the bottom, and then a bead, and then three beads, and a bead, and then something bigger. And then going around the circle, counterclockwise, there are 10 small beads and a space, and then a big bead. 10 small beads, a space, and a big bead. And um, so what these are, these beads, are the particular prayers that would be said as you go around the rosary. So the, um, the, the cross, of course, is your beginning point. And then um, the first prayer is an Our Father, which you all know, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We say that fairly frequently. Um, the three next beads are all Hail Mary, and um, those are the Hail Mary, Queen of Grace, and et cetera, et cetera. There's another Our Father there. And then when you start going around the, the loop, so to speak, 
Each of those sets, there are five of them, and each of them is called a decade. And each one of those beads uh, would also be a Hail Mary prayer as you went around. It's very repetitive, like I said. And then the, the big one, and <laughs> see now I can't reach my notes with the microphone over here to remind myself. I think the big one is the Gloria Patri, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then there's another prayer called a Fatina that goes with that. Um, the Gloria Patri, you know, is glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. We sing that one in our liturgy also. Um, and each one of those decades, as you work your way around, is focused on one of the mysteries of faith and um, different events in the life of Mary and Jesus. So as you are saying the same words over and over again, you are also meditating on various events in the life of Mary and Jesus. So there's a group of sorrowful, there's a group of joyful, there's a group of glorious, and there's a group of uh, luminous, I think, is the other one. So the, um, let me just, huh. if you're interested, and I thought it was interesting. It is interesting. Yeah, I've never even thought about this at all. I'm going to, thank you. I'm going to come over here. So just uh, each, each one of the mysteries is divided out into Five. Right? There are five decades. So, for example, the joyful mysteries would be the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Nativity, the Presentation, and then finding Jesus in the temple. So, as you were going around that first one, you'd be thinking about the Annunciation, the second decade, the Visitation, the third one, the Nativity, fourth one, the Presentation. So, that would just be the joyful mysteries, and those are done on Mondays and Saturdays. The sorrowful mysteries are the agony in the garden, the scourging at the pillar, the crowning of thorns. You can see why these are in that category. Those are Tuesday and Friday. The glorious mysteries are things like the resurrection and the ascension, the coming of the Holy Spirit, those are on Wednesdays. And the luminous mysteries are mystery of light, which are Thursdays, are things like Jesus' baptism, the wedding feast, the proclamation of the kingdom, and the transformation. So it's not really just a matter of saying something over and over again. It's the idea that this prayer is so embedded in you that as you say it over and over again, you're contemplating these other amazing things in the life of Jesus and in the life of Mary as you're working your way around. Um, so it's a really very, it's a very powerful prayer practice um, for someone who does it all the time. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I read someplace that, um, you know, the mass being in Latin for most of history, that this was a way that people who didn't speak Latin could still be doing something during the mass. You could sit and do the rosary, you know, during, during mass. And that would keep you involved in what was going on. So, uh, oh, that's right, the cross is the Apostles' Creed. Um, and then at the very end, you would do the sign of the cross in order to finish it out, <clears throat> the rosary. Um, so prayer beads, Protestants also use prayer beads, and that's what these are. And um, they come in different configurations. You can buy books that talk about how to do prayer beads. I don't want to get overly detailed because there are a whole lot of ways to do them. Um, but the one suggestion I will give is this helpful acronym, ACT. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And I put this one under intercessory prayer because one of the things I like to do with it is as I get to the prayers where I say, you know, something about adoring God and um, confessing something and being thankful for something and then asking for something, is then I like to go back around backwards and I like to ask for something for someone else and then give thanks for someone in my life that I've learned from, and then confess someone that I've hurt and that I need to ask forgiveness from them, and then pray for someone that I really love. Um, and so that one, you can do it with prayer beads, or um, I, you can also like tie something on a string, so like you can think about peace or love or joy or whatever, and then you can use knots instead of beads. So you don't even have to have like the fancy equipment. You can just tie knots in a string, you know, and work your way up and down it's really just for people who like to touch stuff, and that helps you focus. If it helps you focus to touch things, then this sort of thing might be, might be for you. All right. Missions and social justice, active prayers. I think of these as the kind of people, both who want to actually like go out and like build houses for Habitat for Humanity and pray over every piece of wood or every nail as they're doing it. It could also be someone who knits or crochets prayer shawls or quilts someone who organizes a prayer ministry, obviously the intercessory prayers could be a big part of that, or something like a prayer walk where you are walking around a neighborhood and you're praying for the people who live there, you're praying for the government of that area, the schools of that area, you're praying for the safety of the people who live there, 
all of those things. You might even ask God, how can I pray for this neighborhood? How can I pray for this organization? How can I pray for this group of people? Some people do it at churches or at schools. They can be organized you know, in groups. They can just be you on your own. Um, all of those, I think, would fall into that category. And there's not really a set way to do that. It's mostly just being mindful of what it is you want for that community. Um, a big part of, and I'm going to bring up contemplative prayer again, but a big part of contemplative prayer is simply noticing what you notice. So if you can pay attention to the people that you don't normally see when you're walking down the street and even just offer up something quickly for them or for that neighborhood, that can become a prayer. Okay, so mystics, contemplative prayer. Again, the practice of noticing is there in the middle. Centering, uh, meaning being quiet and focused before God. Intercession would be considered the practice of blessing. And then there are all kinds of imaginative things like that gospel imagination that we talked about earlier. So lots of examples of contemplative prayer because this is my favorite and so I know a whole lot of them. But um, centering prayer is often also called meditation. And so they can be as simple as focusing on your breath as you just breathe in and out and sit quietly. They could be things like stretching and being really aware of your body and how you inhabit the body that you have um, as you are breathing. Usually it involves one of two things. Again, that apophatic, cataphatic. You're either trying to let go of all of your thoughts so that God can just be with you, or you're trying to use some kind of image or imaginative thing in order to encounter God in a different way. Uh, that would be those. Again, the Lexio Visio Musica Divina. We talked about that already. Um, I added labyrinth walking here. Has anyone walked a labyrinth? Right, so you know what this is, basically. And I get really excited about labyrinths, and I know I don't have all day, um, and I could talk about labyrinths for a really long time, but if you have interest in sacred geometry, look up the Chartres Cathedral. There's a great book called Chartres, The Masons Who Built a Legend. It's all about how the geometric structures of the building for strength and solidity have been combined with the theological numerology um, in order to uh, have this amazing thing happen at the intersection where those two different systems line up. Um, as you come into the door of the church from the back, uh, you enter the labyrinth first. And um, I think I have a picture of that. There, well, that's not the short labyrinth, but it's a similar shape. Um, anyway, the point is that it's, it's generally a circle and it has the cross overlaying the circle. The, the one in Shark Cathedral is an 11 circuit labyrinth, which means it's like one more than the Ten Commandments and it's one less than the perfect number of 12. No worries. And so, um, so it's actually considered a, a, like sin, as a symbol of sin, and yet the cross overlays it. And so the way of the cross has overlaid this thing of sin in which we inhabit and live. And so when you're walking the labyrinth, and there's all kinds of you know, stuff you can read about mystical energy and because of the sacred geometry and the power of the circle and all that twisting and turning, um, that's really, to me, is fascinating, but it's very complicated. So uh, the main point is that as you walk through the labyrinth, it's, it's basically a metaphor for walking through life. Um, life has twists and turns. You can't see the end coming. It's, not, it's like pilgrimage. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey along the way. It's about walking either with God or with God and with others. Um, the way that you feel as you're walking through the labyrinth is very often reflective of the way things are going in your life. Some people will take something like a stone or a flower or a, a letter or whatever, walk into the labyrinth with it, leave it at the center, and then come back out. I should probably mention that a labyrinth is not a maze. You cannot get lost in a labyrinth. There is only one path. And as long as you follow that one path, you will get to this, to the center. So it's sort of a holy journey that you can take um, as you go. For some people, actually entering the labyrinth and being barefoot so that you're connected to the earth is a really powerful experience. Um, when I was talking about the Chartres Cathedral earlier, um, the places where the two, and I don't have this diagram in here because I wasn't planning on talking about it, but I'm just so excited I can't help it. The, uh, <laughs> The two places on the west end of the building where the labyrinth is and on the east end of the building where the altar is, there are, there are three diamonds um, that make up the basic shape, cross shape of that cathedral. And the, um, the central point, you might think, is like the most important thing because it's the intersection of the two, the two uh, parts of the cross. But actually where the diamond, if you take 
the three diamonds that are made and the circle that goes around the center one, the two points where those things overlap at the cross piece of the, like the diamond of the, um, of the squares on the ends are the, the center of the labyrinth and the altar. So those places where earth and heaven meet are really significant in this building, not just sort of theoretically as an idea, but also very tangibly and very physically in that space. Now we don't always plan that kind of stuff every time we build a labyrinth, and there are labyrinths that are all shapes and sizes, and they aren't necessarily round, and you know, blah, 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 but the idea is the same, that you are entering in, you're following a path, and going to the center praying as you go. Lots of ways you can think about entering a labyrinth. And if you can't physically go to or get into a labyrinth, they make finger labyrinths, and I brought one. I don't know if you can really see it very well because it's this color, but this one is big enough for your finger to follow the channel. And so you can just um, pray as your finger walks the labyrinth for you. Um, I'm trying to do it without looking and I'm talking at the same time, so I may end up um, losing the track and coming out the other side, but then I can think to myself, well, are there times in my life I'm not really paying attention and then I jump the track and then I forget where I'm going? Yes, um, that does happen. So again, uh, you know, parallels for life and, and journey. Finger labyrinth. They, um, What's the appropriate way to get out? Yeah. That, do you just stomp on you just, where you <laughs> That's a good question. Um, and there's probably a lot of debate about that. Um, because some people will say, you know, you go in and you follow this trail all the way to the center. And like pilgrimage, you can't just get transported back home again. Like the journey out is part of the journey. So sometimes I say, absolutely, yes, you should follow it all the way out. But then there are other times where I'm like, well, I really was doing this journey to ask God a question. And if I feel like God has responded in some way, I don't feel the need to walk the whole path back out again. I almost feel like I'm going to be undoing, you know, everything that I did. And that would not be helpful. Um, and so sometimes I do walk out, but hopefully I'm not stomping out. <laughs> that would be that would be bad. I like to think there's no wrong way to do the labyrinth, but stomping might be might be nothing. <laughs> That's good. Um, okay, so circle of trust we already kind of talked about. The examine, this is another Ignatian prayer practice. It's similar to it's not similar to gospel imagination, but it's the same guy the same saint. Um, the medievals gave us really interesting and wonderful things, I've got to say. Uh, the examine is, a, again, the practice of noticing what you notice, and it's basically taking some event in your life, like you sit and you ask God about a particular event of the past day, of the past week, maybe you're thinking about a particular point in your life, and, and you're looking for where is God in this situation. And so you're really picking apart, you know, okay, I was in a meeting yesterday with this person, and I got really angry when they said this thing. So then you'll sit with that, and you'll remember what it felt like, and you'll ask God, why did I feel this? Like, what am I feeling? I have to name it, first of all, name what I'm feeling, and then maybe try to find out what is that connected to? What, why, I mean, I think, I hope some of us have realized that sometimes when people respond to things that happened, they're not responding to what's actually going on at the time, they're responding, or I should say, I am responding to something like totally unconnected to that thing that I carry around with me in my own personal baggage. And so examine is the practice of saying, okay, this thing happened and I was really upset, so why is that? And where can I find healing for that? And how can God touch this thing? How can I um, be more aware of God's presence in these different situations and not carry my baggage around with me or at least not respond to that? How can I be present to that person in the moment rather than uh, responding or reacting out of the past. So examine helps us, it sounds like examine, it's spelled differently. You're gonna ask me about that. <laughs> um, some people, the front row. <laughs> that's right, no, that would be me, so I'm, I'm glad. Um, some people call it examine, I don't know, I, I, examine, examine, examine. It's like I've heard of examine. Okay. Excellent then, out of honor. Huh. Out of, out of so be it. Maybe, that would be interesting. Let's go with that. I would sit with that. <laughs> I would, I would. Um, yeah, examine. And there's a really great app, it's called Reimagining Re Examine, and it's free, and it has, I don't know, 25 or 30 different 
sets of questions that can help lead you through the process of examine. Some of them are things like, what was the high point and the low point of your day? And, and you trust that whatever situation comes to mind is the one that God wanted you to deal with. It's the one that God wanted you to work on. And so it, unlike trying to like figure out and remember everything, it's sort of like, I trust that God will bring to mind whatever thing it is I need to dwell on at this moment to help my spiritual life and to help my spirit to learn. Um, which is part of what's really exciting about it for me. So the next one I have on here is icons. This is more uh, in the category of Eastern Orthodox um, spirituality. And so I brought one. This is a, an icon of um, the, the Book of Revelation, the 12 churches. So you can see the lampstands here and the angels. Well, you probably can't from back there. You probably can't see it, but trust me, this is a uh, Revelation icon. Um, icons are not art. I, I want to be very clear about that. They're not paintings. In fact, when they talk about making icons, they don't paint them. They write them. There's a very specific practice of prayers in order to do an icon in the right order, with the right colors and the right materials. And every um, aspect of creating an item for devotional worship is very intentional and very prayer-filled. And so um, if you think of an icon as an idol, then you would be mistaken. Because the difference between an icon and an idol is that an idol, you're looking at the thing itself, and you are worshiping the thing itself, or you are praying to the thing itself. But an icon is like a window, so that you are looking at this thing, but it is opening a window to what is beyond. And if you think of this, because icons are usually of saints, or biblical stories, or Jesus, or other types of things, um, and I think I have, <coughs> this is one of the most famous ones is by um, Rublev uh, it's the Trinity but it's called Abraham's Guests which if you're into that kind of Old Testament prefiguring New Testament things um, then that would be accurate the three um, members of the Trinity at the table here with an open space in the middle inviting you to the table so if you were to sit with this icon then you might ask God what does it mean to be invited to the table with the Trinity you might um think about hospitality, you might think about, um, I mean, I don't know, this is the part where once again you're trusting what is God going to show you through this time that you spend sitting with this icon. And if it's a saint, it might be something that they did in their life that they can help you to learn or that um, God might speak to you through what you know about what they did. Uh, I don't mean to give credit to the saint for teaching you, it is the Holy Spirit, it is God. Um, that teaches and uh, the veneration of icons is really is a very spiritual practice that looks beyond the object itself to to the reality the spiritual reality behind it um, a lot of Protestants don't know a whole lot about icons but um, I think they're pretty true so meditation <clears throat> we talked about this a little bit already a lot of contemplative things are meditative gospel imagination the Lexio Divina the two in the middle here um, I've got mandalas and tangling Tang um, some people know tangling as zentangle. Zentangle is a trademarked word, um, so I'm not really allowed to use it, but if you've heard of that, that's kind of what I'm talking about. It's like drawing little lines, line after line after line after line after line, and eventually all these little tiny lines, even though they're imperfect and have mistakes, make this beautiful hole at the end. And you can do them in little, um, I think in zentangle they have them in like little sections. Um, <clears throat> if you were to do them in concentric circles, then you would have a mandala. Uh, many of you might be familiar with mandalas from the Buddhist practice with the grains of sand, and they sprinkle them into these beautiful, um, very elaborate, this is probably four or five feet in diameter. It's probably like this table, very large, um, and it would have taken hours and days for them to make this and put it together. And when it's finished, they would blow it away. And the reason why they would do that, we always cringe when we hear that, because we're like, no, it's so beautiful. And they'd say, well, every one of those grains of sand was blessed when it was placed on the table. So by blowing it away, not only are we talking about the impermanence of life, but we're also sending all of these blessings out into the world. And so it's really, it, that's a beautiful practice. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we become Buddhists and start making these sand mandalas, but we can draw mandalas and we can use mandalas. This book here. Um, I teach, a, I teach an art meditative prayer practice, um, and one of the activities that we do is mandalas, where you choose one, and the one that I chose is this one here. I added some things around the outside. Um, but you basically are making your own visio for a visio divina, 
So this one was a mandala where uh, I was sort of intuitive about what colors to choose, and then when I did my reflection and my journaling about it, I was asking the questions like, well now why did the mandala with this shape appeal to me when I had that prayer focus in mind? What is God trying to show me through what happened with those colors? What do I associate with those colors and um, with those things? And what does that remind me of? All those kinds of questions um, that you might ask. So once you get into some of that more imaginative stuff, there are all kinds of prayer practices you can do in terms of um, creating, um, creating visual pieces to sit with. You can think of them as icons or you can think of them as collages. Collage is a wonderful way to explore sort of what's going on under the surface. For some people, we can't verbalize what we're feeling, but we can see it, kind of like I know it when I see it. So if you are looking at a bunch of, say, pictures or magazine pictures or whatever, and then you can pick ones that intuitively you feel drawn to, and then you put them down on the paper, and then you ask God, like, why did I put this one right on top of that one? I really felt like this needed to be in here, but it just didn't fit. I couldn't make it go in. And then you think, well, what else in my life is like that? Or if I was, you know, thinking of a particular situation or person while I was doing this, like, am I trying to fit that person into something? Is, is God trying to tell me that I'm, you know, doing this, this thing that I shouldn't be doing? So um, my main point with all that is that prayer practices are diverse. We have mind-body-spirit connections, kinesthetic and movement-oriented, imaginative, intuitive, cognitive with thinking and noticing, sensory, touch, see, taste, and hear. All of these ways that we can experience God through prayer. And so it's not just sitting and talking to God. So once again, that was a huge overview of, I want to say decades. I'm just going to say decades. Decades of different kinds of prayer. So if you have interest in learning more about any of them, I'm sure that your pastoral staff can help you. If you want to talk to me afterwards, I'll be here for a while. Even better to have Wendy back. <laughs>